So we have, uh, we're going to be reviewing lesson eight, and this will be from Genesis uh, 24 through um, 30. A couple quick things before we get started on the review for tonight. Uh, as you open up lesson nine and get started for this next section, I would like you to get a good map, a Bible map, if you haven't already been you doing that. Uh, this is a great lesson that will really uh, change your understanding of it if you have maps access. So a website that I do recommend is BibleAtlas.org, BibleAtlas.org. And I use that. Uh, you can use anything you know else that you find, but I, that's one that I have found consistently helpful and it has a lot of good details in there. You know how it is. Uh, if you uh, if you told a friend, oh, I'm going to be in San Francisco, then I'm going to go see a friend in Salem, Oregon, and then I'm going to be I'm heading down to San Diego. We in this room can put that in our brain probably. So we can understand that. We can put that in our mind. But if we're talking to somebody who's not from this area, they'll be like, well, maybe they'll just draw a straight line and they won't have a frame of reference for that. But as soon as you know that San Francisco's in that middle spot, Salem's way up there, you know, San Diego's way down there. And then of course, if you happen to go to Iowa, then everything changes. There we go. That's why she doesn't know what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, so having understanding of where things are changes the dynamic because then once you understand that, you're like, oh, that's quite a that's quite a trip you're undertaking. And are you going to swing back through San Francisco on your way back down to San Diego? And why are you heading up there first? I mean, if I were you, I'd like maybe try to make it all in one consecutive. So you start thinking about it differently and maybe other questions come into your mind, like why are you doing it that way? And you engage with them differently as a result of knowing where all those things are on a map. Same thing's gonna happen, especially in chapter, or lesson nine as you go through these passages. So be mindful of that as you do that. And then um, on another side note, you know, as you are Googling things and maybe you'll say like, where is Beersheba? You know, on a Google map, like anybody does, and it'll come up on a map or what have you. Uh, I want to caution you on your Googling or DuckDuckGoing or whatever you're using for your browser. Uh, not all websites are created equal. And so have some discernment as you land on such and such a website. Uh, there are certain churches, I use air quotes on that, that pay to have theirs found pretty high up in your search. So double check where you're heading before you bop into their site. Uh, the Mormon church is one of them. Uh, they'll, they'll pay to get theirs up high. You'll see, you know, Church of Jesus Christ sounds fabulous until you realize it's of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do the same. Um, there's, a, there's quite a few. So have some discernment. If you land on a page and you get a sketchy feeling off of it, then maybe trust that. And then also ask, ask me or your Bible study leader if you're not sure and say, hey, I found this site. It seems good, but I'm not 100% sure and check into that. So that's just a, a word of caution and encouragement for all things Bible study, especially this week when I'm really encouraging you to do some looking up on, on maps and things like that. So uh, we have quite a chunk to go through tonight. A lot of time is going to pass and incredible moments in the patriarch's life. And I'm going to spend a good chunk of time actually on chapter 24. That it's going to be weighted very heavily on chapter 24. And so if you're feeling like, is she ever going to wrap up? We're only on 24. Uh, it's on purpose. And there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, but I'll, and I'll explain that as we continue on. Uh, as we also move into this next lesson, I want us to be thinking more and more in terms of how to be better at studying the Bible and looking for things and reading and understanding scripture and, and putting more tools in our toolkit for understanding them. One of those tools is understanding literary devices. You remember when you were in grade school and you had simile and metaphor and allegory and different things like that. A great literary device that's used in general works uh, is called typology, right? Typology is also used in the Bible. And uh, there's going to be some examples of that coming up in today's review lesson. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And you might be thinking, did she talk about that in the lesson and I missed that part? I deliberately did not go into typology in lesson eight because I wanted to, I didn't want it to be a distraction for reasons I'll explain in a, in a minute. And then um, if you were with us in the Hebrews Bible study, which I think was three, maybe four Bible studies ago, 
uh, we covered typology quite a bit because the author of Hebrews himself actually literally says this is a type, this is a, a foreshadowing in a sense or an image. So let me explain a little bit about um, uh, typology and what that looks like. Uh, it's an illustration of sorts in the Bible and it's, we call it a type, which is typology or a type. Uh, types are used in scripture. It's a way of helping us understand a new principle as we think about an older idea or an older former person in history, or even an event, it could be an item, that ends up representing something. And we've talked at length about uh, the, the reality that the, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I prefer to refer to the old as the foundational, because what do we tend to want to do with old things, like toss that out, that's old, right? And we don't need that, we don't want to toss it out, it's the foundation for the new. And the word testament, we don't really anchor really well in our modern English. It actually means covenant. So it's old covenant, new covenant, because Jesus himself said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And we have that uh, communion that begins to represent that. So it's really old covenant, new covenant, or foundational covenant and new covenant, if you want to think of it that way. So types are used in scripture all throughout. Uh, Peter, when we studied P Peter, we, we heard about this and in church on Sundays. Uh, he refers to Noah's flood, and he himself explains that it's a, it's, a, it's a type, right? So this event becomes a type that reminds us in the new covenant that God will judge and God will rescue the righteous. Just like he judged and rescued the righteous in Noah's day, he's going to do it here. Um, the author of Hebrews uses a type as a building. It says the tabernacle is a, a tabernacle is the figure, uh, the building for understanding Jesus Christ and him actually as a person. Uh, like the high priest would go in through the Holy of Holies. Jesus ultimately breaks through and goes to the Holy of Holies. He's continually now in the presence of God. I mean, pay no attention. That It's been going off and on. We lost all internet in here. I'm just going to turn it off. That's just going to be a distraction if it comes back on again, at least for me. <laughs> and I have no slides anyway tonight, so it's just looking pretty in the background. Um, so um, it, the author of Hebrews uses types typology, and uh, he represents, or he says that Jesus is represented by the tabernacle. The temple veil itself is a type of Christ. It represents his body. The veil was torn from top to bottom like Jesus' own body was torn, okay? So types are used in the Bible all the time. And uh, so as we move into these chapters ahead that you've already studied, we're gonna actually see two types that help us to understand things in the New Testament. And if you have been here and listening for the last few weeks, what is the best commentary on the Old Testament? New Testament. Good job. The Old Testament gets that commentary and we get illumination from the New. So if it's specifically mentioned in the New Testament, we really want to hold on to that. If it's alluded to or there's a sensibility about that in the New Testament, we're going to check that out. And if the scripture is silent in the New Testament about something in the Old, then we can have our ideas, thoughts, and man-written commentaries. And then we're not going to build a church on something like that. That's not really illuminated well. So with all that in mind, we're going to start in on uh, chapter 24, and I want you to have that now in, in your head as we move forward. So chapter 24, we pick up here with Abraham, and he's old, and he's advancing in years, and um, verse 1, and I'm going to be reading, by the way, out of the ESV tonight because of some wording choices the ESV uses, so I'm going to stick with that one for my message tonight. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things, and this goes back to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and his promises and covenant he made. And Abraham says to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had. And he goes in and he starts talking about what he's going to say. So notice that throughout chapter 24, we, we have no name for this servant. But in our mind, we're like, well, what servant would this be? This would be the main guy in charge. And hopefully by now you've already anchored that in that this is Eleazar, right? His oldest of his household, his servant, he had charge of everything he had. Um, where do we remember the big Eleazar scene previously in Genesis? Do you recall where that was? Chapter 20, uh, chapter 14, the big battle, 
He was in a big battle. He was sent with the 318 men to kick butt on those bad kings. And uh, right after all that, we uh, meet Melchizedek, and uh, Abraham gives him a tenth of everything and blesses him. And then later on during the chapter on circumcision, he's alluded to because he gets circumcised. He's, he's brought in under the covenant because of that. And so uh, Abraham even later on says, God, you're going to really do all this because everything's going to go to Eleazar. And God says, no, nope, I, I got another thing coming, remember? Hang on, don't, don't jump ahead of the plan. And then he does. Anyway, <laughs> as they all have done. So uh, Abraham says to this servant, this unnamed servant, that we, in our mind, remembering, oh, that's going to be Eleazar. Um, and he says, put your hand under my thigh, and I'll have you swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven, God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites from among whom I dwell, but will go to my country, my kindred, take a wife for my son, Isaac. And we start seeing this amazing relationship he has with this very trusted servant who's going to go and do his bidding and prepare the way. And um, he says, put your hand under my thigh, which is a Hebrew euphemism for basically, um, um, hold on to my genitals. I'll just say it like that. Uh, it's, it's basically putting his hand over his genitals where he had been circumcised because you're promising on my future seed is what that means. So this is how serious that promise is. So if we say thigh, but really it would be like upper, upper inner thigh. How's that? <laughs> and uh, it, it's reference to on my, on my seed, on my future born, um, because we have to have a promise coming through. Remember what the entire concept of Genesis is? Lost and found, right? We have lost that fellowship with God, and he's in the process of finding the solution. And he already knows it, and he needs time to go through and the seed to come. And so we have to protect the family line. And so we've got, you know, Adam, and he loses it, and uh, it goes through, and he has his kids, and they kill and fight. And then the next guy comes along, and finally we get to Abraham, and God hones in and says, your seed is the one, and I'm going to send the promise through you. And uh, so he, this servant then is on this mission because... Isaac can't have a seed promise continuing if he's not married. He needs to get married. So bringing that bride to Isaac is an extremely important part of God making this promise come true. So this is a big, big, big deal. So the servant confirms this and clarifies the contingency. You know, what if that woman isn't willing? Should I come back and get your son and, you know, bring him out? And Abraham says, no, do not take my son out of this land. Um, he reiterates this great covenant promise that God gives to him. And he says, verse 7, Yahweh will send an angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son. There is strong confidence from Abraham that he knows an angel's going to go ahead and take care of business and prepare the way, and uh, you shall take us a wife. You're going to find the bride that needs to happen. And then he kind of hedges his bets in just a minute. And he releases him then from this mission if a woman cannot be found. So his, like, his flesh comes kind of kind of comes right back in on that. So verse 9, the servant puts his hand under the thigh, the upper, upper inner thigh of Abraham, his master, and swears to him concerning the matter. Um, so he goes on this long trip up to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor, and he makes the camels kneel down outside the city uh, by this well of water at evening time. And the author makes note very specifically that this is the time when women go out mm -hmm. to dwell water. Very specific. Why include that detail? So that as the reader and who was the original audience reading or listening to this book would have been Moses and his people going through and all the subsequent generations from that. The author wants us to know that that woman was at the well at the time where women should be at wells. This is normal for their culture. Um, it's in the dusky, cooler part of the day, women go out to draw that. Now contrast that with another very famous scene at a well when a woman who goes to that well does not go to the well at a time that is customary for women. And we have a very important uh, meeting that happens as a result of that. Does anyone happen to trigger in your brain a woman that goes to a well at the wrong time? Yeah. The woman at the well, we even call her that. And she's a Samaritan woman that Jesus later engages with and it's recorded in the book of John and he meets her at the well and she's at this well at the heat of the day because uh, she's a Samaritan and also because she has been sleeping around, she has all this issue in her, in her life. It's 
really warm in here or is it just me? Can you just tap that and bring the temperature down for me? And if you're cold, somebody will give you a jacket. I'm going to pass out up here. Um, thank you. So he um, goes to this at that time of day. It's in the dusky evening pint time and he sees her there and he says, oh Lord, Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show, and in the ESV it reads, steadfast love. So this is an important phrase throughout the Bible. And every translation will kind of work it a little differently, but in the Hebrew, the wording is consistent. And the word is chesed, and it's, it's a hard H sound. You'll see it throughout. We talked about this at the last lesson. Uh, the book of Ruth emphasizes this quite a bit, but it's chesed. This is going to come up a lot, and it's very important. So uh, highlight, underline that, and write chesed um, at the side of, in your margins if you want to. He says, show chesed, show loving kindness, steadfast love, to my master Abraham. And so Eliezer prays, and he asks for a sign. And here's what's unique about him asking for a sign. This is the first time a sign along this, um, these lines has been asked for, and it's a non-miraculous sign. In other words, he doesn't ask for God to do anything crazy, like defy nature. This is something that could naturally happen. If you're thinking in your mind of another famous guy later on who does ask for a sign, he asks for God to give a sign, and it's a miraculous thing, like make nature change so I really know that you're doing this. And we even have a figure of speech for that. It's called setting out a fleece. And it's the time when Gideon says, I don't know if this is really going to work or not, so I'm going to put this fleece out and make the do here and not there, and he does it the next day and flips it all around. So this is Eliezer, and he's asking for a sign, but it's a non-miraculous sign. This is like breakthrough, but make this really special thing that could maybe normally happen. So this is pretty incredible, because it's nuanced, right? It's very nuanced here. And he says, I'm standing at a spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar and may I drink, uh, and who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant, Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown chesed, steadfast love, again, here we go, to my master. So before he finishes speaking, the prayer starts to be answered. Now, think. What had Abraham promised him was going to happen to get the ball rolling on all of this? An angel has gone ahead to prepare that way. And so things are moving. People are being where they need to be. And so now he's just like, is she going to be? This is pretty incredible. I haven't even finished praying. And boom, there's this lady. She comes out, and she's got the water jar on her shoulder. And she's hot, like literally very attractive. And it's probably warm out is why I'd imagine. And, uh, and she's a virgin. And you can tell that because uh, they don't wear signs. Hey, I'm a virgin. They had like certain clothing they would wear. And it would indicate they're not married yet. And the servant, this unnamed servant, who we all know is Eliezer, he strolls over to meet her because he's cool, right? Oh, what does it say in scripture? He runs to her, so enthusiastic. And, and highlight or underline that in your Bible as well because that's going to come up with importance in a moment. He runs to meet her and he says, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. Period, full stop. Doesn't tip her hand, doesn't say anything else. Just give me a little water to drink from your jar. Eliezer makes the first move by asking for water that he can drink, but he's kind of fishing for the right response that he's already prayed about that he wants to have happen. Will that woman do only what is asked for by the letter of the law? Or is she going to show chesed? See, anybody can just do what someone's asked. Chesed is going further and really embracing it and noticing it and saying, you're probably thirsty, and I bet your camels are really thirsty as well. And if you recall from the story, he has 10 camels with him and the men. And he's been outfitted by Abraham with gold and jewels and, and clothing, everything to, to sh shower on this hopefully future bride, right? And she says, drink, Lord. And uh, quickly, she lets down her jar uh, on her hand, gives him a drink. When she finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too. Ta-da! <laughs> Awesome, right there. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough. And what does she do in response? Stroll? She runs again 
So he runs, she runs to the well to drink water. Now in your mind, you might be thinking a well, like in like a wishing well at Disneyland or something with the little bucket and the, the wood bar and it cranks and there, people are singing songs around in the middle of the village or whatever, right? You're writing it. No, it's not like that at all. In the Middle East, a well would have been dug down, 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 so far down that they estimate probably in this region that the well would have been down at least 20 to 30 steps down. Now, if I handed you this bottle of water right here and I said, do you those steps over there in the hallway? Would you walk up and down those steps? You'd be like, I could totally do that. If I gave you then a 40 gallon of this to walk up and down those steps, you're like, okay, Richmond, I'll do that for you. And I say, could you do it 10 more times, please? Huh? And then could you double the amount of stairs, right? And then do it in the dusty, uh, desert of the Middle East and this is what she does. She doesn't just lollygag around and spin a little thing and sing little songs and there she goes with her wealth. This woman is working. So the author is deliberately painting a picture of Rebecca who we know is going to be the bride, the perfect bride. He, the author is painting the picture of this woman who is eager, she's working, she's beautiful, she's a virgin, she meets all the criterion, and she doesn't just do the letter of the law, but it's as she does the spirit of the law, basically. You know, she enters into chesed with this man she doesn't even know, right? And unlike her brother we see later, uh, who sees all the jewels, she just sees him, and she just responds in kind to him. When the camels finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighing half a shekel, two bracelets for her arms, rang ten gold shekels, and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your, what does it say, father's house? And, and she may as well have said, Sure, in my father's house there's many mansions. Mm -hmm. I'll get to that later. For us to spend the night, she said to him, I am the daughter of, and she goes into her family line, and Nathan's my brother, blah, blah, blah. We have plenty, both straw and fodder. And there's room in the inn, basically, um, to spend the night. There's room for you to come in here. And she confirms that her character is chesed because she gives all this information, all this detail to him. He bows his head down. He's like, aha, I found you. You know, he worships Yahweh right there in front of her. And she's witnessing him, this display. She's got the jewels and she's got his words. And uh, she's been up and down and up and down. You would think she'd be tired and wants to sit down. And she's watching him. And he says, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his chesed his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. And then the young woman, what does she do? She runs again. <laughs> she is so powerful and strong and beautiful and eager. Just the picture of this amazing bride. She tells her mother's household all about these things. Rebecca had a brother, his name is Laban. Laban ran out to the man to the spring. And as soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, heard the words of Rebecca's sister. He's like, cha-ching, let's make this deal happen. And we know from later on that he is the kind of guy who wants to work a deal and make all this stuff happen. So, right. So, Eleazar describes Abraham's blessings, his purpose there. He says, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord's greatly blessed my master. He's come and he's given him and he goes into all the stuff that he's given him. And then he says, um, he says, the Lord before whom I have walked will send an angel with you and prosper your way. And indeed he does. And he confirms the promise, promises to make her the bride. And he gives all that credit to Yahweh. He puts the ring on her nose. It would have been a very small little, like a, 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 less than half of an ounce uh, would be that nose ring. And that indicates marriage or betrothal and the bracelets on her arms. And he bows his head and worships the Lord. Bless the Lord, the God of my master, who had led me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Verse 49. Now then, if you are going to show chesed, steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may return to the right or to the left. He wants to get on with his mission. He wants to move and make this deal happen and finish what he's been sent to do. Laban Bethuel answered, that's the brother and the dad, this thing's come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you good or bad. I like that. Make a note. You're going to get to that in lesson nine. We're going to come back to this. I'm not going to illustrate that anymore tonight, but maybe make a note so you're like, oh, that's right. I remember that from verse 50. We cannot speak to you bad or good. That's going to come up again later. Verse 51, Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. Abraham's servant heard the words. He bowed himself again. This guy is with the bowing. Um, and to the earth before the Lord. 
And uh, Laban's family wanted to remain 10 days as a nod, also foreshadowing something that's going to happen in a few chapters. Lesson 9, you'll read about this 10-day issue thing going on. And um, the servant's like, yeah, no, I need to go. Don't delay me. He, got, he has to be about his father's work. He wants to get the father's work done. Don't delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. All right. Um, so he does, and then we're going to pause right there. All right. All right. So why did I open up with types and typology? And what does this even mean? And what, what's the significance here? Number one. Throughout this entire passage, the author gives us no name for this servant. We're filling in the blanks and we're realizing based on what's happening here that it's Eleazar. But he's an unnamed servant who does the father's will and prepares the way and makes sure um, that the son of the father will have the suitable bride, right? So when we're thinking about typology in your mind, you're thinking, well, who's the father in the Bible? Who's the son in the Bible? Who's an unnamed servant? And I want you to think right now in your head, what does Eliezer's name mean? Eli, Azer. Well, Azer is helper. It's the exact same word used in the Genesis when um, Adam create, uh, God creates Eve, the helper, and Azer for him. I'm pointing to the side of my uh, ribs here because that's where he, you know, figuratively makes her out of. And uh, he, it, it's God's helper, right? And you think of anybody else mentioned in the entire scripture that is referred to as the helper. Holy oh, Holy Spirit is indeed. So Eleazar is a type of Holy Spirit who goes before and prepares the son to meet who? The bride. Mm -hmm. The bride. And who is the bride of Christ in Scripture, all throughout Scripture? Why does God make such a big deal to make sure we understand? It's one man, one woman, for life, committed in chesed loves, steadfast, faithful love to one another forever. It's because that's a model of the marriage supper between the Lamb and his bride. And we, as believers, are the bride of Christ. And the Holy Spirit has gone before to make that happen for us. How beautiful is that to imagine? And as you go back through, and I hope you do, reread chapter 24 on your own and see all the parallels to Rebecca and the bride. And think about this also as you continue to read. How many wives does Abraham have? Two. Two. Three. Three. Uh, and how many wives does Jacob have? Four. Four at least, right? He has four. How many wives does Isaac have? One. One. The only patriarch that has one wife. And the patriarch that is represented is Jesus Christ because who was the one that went up to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed and he was a type of Christ on Mount Moriah. And so Isaac's the type of Christ, Abraham's the type of the God the Father, and Eliezer, the unnamed helper servant, is the one who prepares the way for the bride. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. So continue to, to look for that as you work out through your studies. And on that note, I'll, I'll caution you, don't overthink those types of things. If the New Testament is silent on that, then we're not going to build a church around it, right? We're not going to hang our hat on a devotional and doctrinal hats on those types of things. But listen to this as it continues on. We move over and we, we shift the scene. Um, Rebecca goes with them, the, the unnamed Eliezer, let me know, servant. And we go to verse 62. And we haven't heard from Isaac in a while. What's going on with him? The father doesn't engage with Isaac and say, hey, so what kind of lady are you looking for? A blonde? You want a brunette? What kind of guy should I send out? No, Isaac's been silent until verse 62. We start to see, oh, here's Isaac again. Isaac returned from Beer Lahoy uh, Royi. And we just recall right now in your mind, if you can, who named that? Who named that location? Do you remember? It was Hagar. Yes, Hagar or Hagar. Names it and she names it for the God who is the one who sees. And so that's where Isaac is. Isaac is with in that location there, the Bir Lahoi Roy, and uh, he's dwelling in the Negev. And in verse 63, Isaac went out to meditate. What's Isaac doing? Praying. He's away and he's praying. Mm -hmm. He's preparing right? He's in the field, he's toward evening, and he lift up his eyes, and he saw, and behold, mm -hmm. and next thing we see from Rebecca is the very same thing. Rebecca lifts up her eyes, mm -hmm. and when she saw Isaac, she dismounts from the camel. She says to her servant, 
who's that man walking the field? Like, we feel this love story, but I mean, this could be a really, hopefully not cheesy Hallmark movie, but it could be a great Hallmark movie, or maybe the director of The Chosen will do it well and, and do this. Who's that man? And the servant says, well, that's my master. It's like, its whole mission was for to bring you two together because you need to have a baby that's going to save all of humankind. Maybe he didn't tell her that part. <laughs> so she takes her veil. She covers herself up. She prepares herself as the bride. Right? She does the right thing. She covers herself, so she maintains that purity. Uh, and then the servant tells Isaac all the things that he's done. Isaac brings her to the tent of Sarah, takes Rebecca, becomes a wife, and Isaac's comforted after his mother's death. Beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit going before and finding the bride of Christ, and uh, literally, the dis ultimately, the descendant right there who will be. All right, so we move to chapter 25. Abraham takes another wife. Her name is Keturah, um, and she gives birth, and we have this whole list. And one name I want to point out to you is this guy Midian that she gives birth to, and he has a bunch of kids too. Sons of Midian are named this guy. Uh, his people, the Midianites, uh, play later on. We'll see him um, in other studies as we go forward. But interestingly about Keturah is her name is, um, the root of the word is spice, or spicy, spices. And um, of the people, because uh, we know later on in the story that Abraham sends all those kids off to the east of the east of the east. It actually kind of emphasizes how far east he wants to send them off. He sends them to the east. And uh, we know from studying history that that area uh, where they all end up settling is very famous. We call it the spice trade area. And that's like the roots were the spice trade. And it comes from uh, Keturah's family. And, and again, interesting that her name actually means spice. Um, we meet a lot of her children later on in scripture, but others we don't really ever hear from again. And that Midian son, uh, he plays a large role in the life of Moses later on. Uh, that's Midian again. And um, the Midianites are the ones that are famous for spice, in particular, frankincense. So I want you to think also again, like how is God nodding to the future and foreshadowing things are going to end up happening later in the promised son's life, Jesus Christ's life, uh, because we have the family tree of Abraham producing the spice trade. In particular, frankincense, not to mention other spices, for example, myrrh. And of course, they would probably have gathered gold along the way as well. Huh, who could that possibly be? Yes, indeed, that entire region is where the wise men, that we call them now, would have traveled through, gathering up the frankincense that Abraham's own family had established that trade back then. And they return it back and they give it all back to Jesus. Again, coming full circle on the promises from Genesis 12 that you're going to be a great nation and a great blessing in all nations are going to be blessed because of you and we see that happening right then and there so abraham give gave all he had to isaac verse six to, but to the sons of his concubines he gives them gifts uh, while he's still living he sends them away eastward toward the east it says which is a very in other words like way away because he wants isaac to have a special time isaac and ishmael's sons they bury him in the cave of Machpelah. The only property Abraham actually ends up owning is that cave, and we have one other patriarch who owns land later on, and that's it. The patriarchs never own land other than that. So Isaac settles at Beer Lahoy Roy, and where he had been meditating before and praying right before he meets um, uh, Rebecca, which is beautiful. So we wrap up at that point the longest of the Toledotes in the Bible. And uh, in that is the longest chapter of the Bible, by the way, chapter 24, uh, not the Bible, uh, Genesis. Uh, Genesis 24 is the longest of all the chapters. And I think that's, it's important to, to think about that because you would think maybe creation would get a super long chapter. Or maybe the fall, or maybe Tower of Babel, or maybe Noah and the flood would get a really, really long, a lot of details in there. We don't get what we want though. And then we get to this chapter 24 with this, the entire chapter is about this unnamed servant and his big mission. And it's the longest chapter in all of Genesis, 67 verses. And uh, I think there's a significance even in that, that the author takes so much time to go into that. So that ends the longest toledote, which is of Terah. And then we begin the shortest toledote, which is about little Ishmael. <laughs> and so he goes into the uh, generations of Ishmael there in, in verse 12. Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. And just to wrap up that little total note, he settled in verse 18. He settled over against all his kinsmen. So this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of, about Ishmael that he would come up against his people. And that's literally 
how it says it there in verse 18. Then we move on from that Toledot to the Toledot of Isaac in verse 19, and we see that key tip-off wording, these are the generations of, and then Isaac, Abraham's son. So Isaac's 40 years old when he takes Rebekah, and Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Again, we have a, a woman of the prophesied line, the seed line of promise, and she's barren. And we see that theme coming up over and over and over again. Very special women are blessed with barrenness, if you want to think of it that way. And she's barren. He prays, and the Lord grants his prayer, and Rebecca, his wife, conceives. The children struggle together with her, and she says, oh, if this is thus, why is it happening to me? I mean, think about it this way. She, like they would have in that day, uh, would have seen women be pregnant and have babies before. They all had a red tent where women would go and be in together. And so she knows this is really different, and she's feeling this. You know, the Hebrew wording there that the children are struggling within her is actually means mayhem inside of me. It means they were being, it says uh, they were, it's violent, it's being smashed together, and it's very, there's an unusual nature to how she's describing. So this isn't just like, hey, I've seen kids inside of moms before moving around. This is really different. And so we see another interesting Hebrew word next. At the end of verse 22 there, she went to inquire of the Lord. Believe it or not, here we are, 25 chapters into Genesis, and we have the very first use of the word inquire of the Lord. And you're like, that can't be true. It is, <laughs> and it's a woman who does the inquiring. She inquires of the Lord, and she gets an answer. We have women who've cried out, like Hagar you know, is crying, and she's seen, but Rebecca, she's amazing. We've seen her from the beginning. Powerful Rebecca, uh, taking the initiative, Rebecca, and here she is. She goes to the Lord. Her husband prays, she gets pregnant, and then she's like, what's going on? And she takes that initiative and goes to the Lord. What is happening? And he gives her an answer. You want to know what's happening? You have two nations in your room. She's like, no joke. You know, it feels like a war going on inside me and two peoples are going to be divided. One's going to be older than the other, uh, stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And so right then and there, she's like, whoa, this is big. And again, remember, the promised seed is the focus here. We're working through that. All of Genesis is looking for uh, this idea of lost to found, and it can only be found if that seed makes it all the way through to, of course, Jesus Christ. And she's part of that promise. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. First comes out red. His body is a hairy cloak. They call him Esau. His name means red. But his name also comes with the implication of a completed man. In other words, when they saw him, it's like, whoa, this kid already finished puberty. He's already had his hair. You know, he's a hairy guy. And he's, you know, red. Um, and probably because of all the struggling going on and probably also because of the red hair he has. And uh, so that's what it, fascinating that his name kind of has all that connotation with him. And afterwards, his brother comes out holding on to Esau's heel. So they name him Yaakov or heel grasper, which is uh, what that means. So note also in verse 26, how old is Isaac? 60 years. Interesting. That means it was 20 years later that she bore. In other words, he prayed, and it was 20 more years before she actually gave birth. So it wasn't like he prayed, she gets pregnant, she gives birth. He prayed for 20 years, because he's 60 at this point. So 20 years later, God answers that prayer, and isn't that a great reminder to each and every one of us for the things that we're longing for and praying for, that he prayed and prayed and prayed. And here's the deal. God knew all along he was gonna give him a son. It's gonna be a big deal. He's gonna give him two. But he took, it takes him 20 years. Remember that mysterious verse way back when uh, Abraham is praying and God's, uh, for relief and God says, the wickedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. God's got his reason for the wicked and for the good to wait. Sometimes it's the wickedness that isn't done and sometimes it's just the goodness of life that isn't done. And we see that right here as this example. So the boys grew up. Esau's a skillful hunter. He's a man's man. Um, Jacob's quiet, dwelling in tent. And I actually want to skip, I, I skipped a part I wanted to point out to you also. Um, the first thing comes out, verse 25. First guy comes out, Esau, and um, make a note of it in your Bible. Who names him Esau? What does it say? They. Underline they. Verse 26. After his brother comes out holding Esau's heel, who names him Jacob? His name was called, passive tense. So in the Hebrew wording here, we see 
parental involvement, both of them, this is a clear, obvious statement of reality of Esau. He's red, he's fully grown in a sense, so they name him what they see. But when we get to the naming of Jacob, the parents aren't in agreement on the name. There's something going on here. My thought on this is there's probably already, as we know is gonna happen in a minute, favoritism going on already. Okay. Something's up here. Because I don't think Rebecca really liked that Jacob is called heel grasper because of all the connotation that wording ends up with it. Um, so again, we're not gonna build a church on this verse, but I just feel like that's significant that they call him name Esau and then his name was called. And there's no they there in the Hebrew. It's pretty clear um, that there's a withholding there. Like there's, she's not involved in the naming of that. It's, he gets, he gets called this because he's, she sees this. So we see favoritism, I think, right here. Obviously, with the prophecy, we know something's going to happen, and then this situation happens. So the author is deliberately writing the story to help us to see battle is already starting. Like, things aren't right, and even marriage isn't right. Like, it's not right, and you're going to see that because the breakdown of their marriage is what leads to a lot of the issues that end up happening that pushed one child above the other when it shouldn't have been and they both it's just a lot of tangled right so when the boys grow up he's a skillful hunter man's man and uh, jacob was quiet dwelling in tents uh isaac loves esau because he ate of his game that's significant because when he goes to do the blessing later on isaac is all about the food he's always all about the food and everything we hear about from isaac from this point forward is uh passions based like passions in the sense of your personal what you want out of life um in the selfish sense and gratifying your your fleshly desires but rebecca loves jacob so again right there the author is again saying there's favoritism going on so we get to this little uh you know top chef cooking scene right here uh with jacob's um cooking this stew isa's in he's fabish and he's super dramatic like his parents and grandparents were <laughs> about to die you know so very very middle eastern really honestly in the drama and how he words things what use is a birthright to me he's like why did you even go there so jacob makes him swear and thus esau despised his birthright in more ways than one right Verse chapter 26, now there's a famine, and we've seen this play out before. The whole famine scenario comes up here. And this famine triggers some very interesting events. It triggers a, a blessing, a reiterated blessing from God to um, uh, Isaac. And a, a unique situation because we have another Abimelech. Abimelech is a title, probably like a pharaoh. It's, probably not, it's not the same Abimelech as we met earlier. But there's a famine in this land, and it's um, where Isaac had been in the Bier le Royi, which is about southwest by most maps reckoning. Not all people agree on that, but probably southwest of the Dead Sea, if you can picture that in your brain. Um, and then Gerar is north of that and a little bit east. It's kind of in between the Dead Sea um, in the Mi and Mediterranean Sea. If you kind of split the difference, Gerar is right in there. So that's in the... As it was in the days of Abraham, um, they get this famine. All right, so the Lord appears to him and says, don't go to Egypt. <laughs> do not do that. Dwell in the land, which I will so show you. Sojourn in this land. I will be with you, future tense. Mm -hmm. I will bless you. I will establish you. I will multiply. Your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then he gives this very interesting verse five. Because... Abraham obeyed my voice. Abraham kept my charge. Abraham kept my commandments. Abraham kept, kept my statutes. And Abraham uh, kept my laws. All right. If you know anything about the Bible right now, you're thinking, the law hasn't been given yet. Moses hasn't met on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. How is Abraham keeping the law? Where's the law come from? Right? I believe because Abraham was close with God, friend of God. The law was on Abraham's heart. The law was on Abraham's heart. And he was that commune, he was, had that kind of communion with God. So even before the law was written, Abraham had it on his heart, right? You kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws, obeyed my voice, and you're thinking, he did though? <laughs> did he though? <laughs> but remember, he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Right? And so we have to let go of that perfection of like keep every single law, obey every single thing, and then God will be right with me. Certainly didn't work in Abraham's world like that. 
but he was credited as righteousness, and then he gets credited with obeying a law that had never yet been, had not even been given. So, you get this lie scenario starts up again. Isaac settles in Gerar, not quite obeying what he was told to do, because God specifically said, sojourn. He didn't say settle. Oh, Isaac. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Abimelech goes out and they get this whole thing ends up happening because he lies about him being the sister. Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looks out the window and he's like, well, I wouldn't cuddle with my sister like that. <laughs> That's a weird brother-sister relationship. This is an interesting word. Um, this is the word sahak, sahak. And um, it's actually the same root word as Isaac's name, laughter. And Sarah, laughing. And uh, it, it is translated elsewhere in the Bible as caressing. It might be even in your translation as caressing or sporting. If you have an older Bible like King James, I think says sporting. So it's this interesting word here. And Abimelech notices it and says, hey, <laughs> that's not your sister. So this isn't just like giggling. They're doing something that somebody would say, hey, about. All right. So um, they make this pact. And whoever touches this man, the Bimelech says, is going to die. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. In spite of his disobedience, he was supposed to soldier, and he plants a field anyway. And the Lord blesses him in spite of not really truly obeying. And uh, the man became rich, gained more and more, and became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds. God's going to get his plan done. I'm going to bless you, right, in spite of yourself. And the Philistines end up envying him. They have this, all the shenanigans going on with the well. And from there, he goes up to Beersheba, and the Lord appears to him that same night, and he says, I am the God of your father Abraham. Fear not, I am with you. He said, I will be, I will be, I with you, I will be. And now he says, I am with you, I will bless you, multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. Why? Because Abraham's the one that did all the obeying from before. So he builds this altar, calls upon the name of the Lord, pitches his tent there. Isaac's servants end up getting this well dug there. And we opened the chapter with famine and we ended up with finding water because we know later on they, they are successful in their attempt to have water. And they, the Philistines say, we plainly see that the Lord has been with you. That's a play on words in the Hebrew. It's ra'a ra'a. We see, see. We super see. It's the same exact word pretty much used twice as ra'a ra'a. Um, so it's just like this, we really see, this is like, there's no way of missing this, that the Lord, and they use the Lord Yahweh's name, has been with you. And um, so that scene wraps up. They have the water. They're excited. Peace um, happens as a result in verse 31. And he calls it Sheba, and the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. We move back to Esau. He's 40. He gets a wife, the Hittite's wife, and we get this commentary <laughs> that they make life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. So then we move to chapter 27 on this tone of bitterness, and boy, is it going to get even worse, right? So Isaac's eyes are old and dim. He's blind in more ways than one, and he cannot see. And he's a bit dramatic also. He's like, I don't know when I'm going to die. Well, he lives like another 40 years, by the way, after this moment. He doesn't croak over, but he makes it sound like he's going to go at any minute. And uh, so... Uh, Rebecca overhears the whole thing. Oh, give me some food. I'm going to bless you. And she's like, not on my watch. You're going to bless him. And so here's Rebecca, strong, able, capable. Rebecca using her very strength and her skill set that God's given her for the wrong goals. And you can argue that point because wasn't she just trying to make sure the prophecy happened? I'm like, wow, who, does, who needs to try to make sure prophecies happen? How about if we just let God do his thing and quit doing the wrong thing to make it happen and then justify, well, I was just doing it the way God, God said so, and so I'm going to do, you're going to be a sneaking, conniving, awful human being and set yourself up, your son up to have to lie repeatedly and all the stress that would have been on Jacob to go in and be all sneaky. And he's just like a little mama's boy. He's like just doing it. He covers in ghost skin. Oh, it's just this most awkward, cringy scene. And I had, literally I've had people say, well, she's just trying to make sure the prophecies are fulfilled. I'm like, I think there are like more lawful ways of making sure that the prophecies are fulfilled. Like sit down, bide your time and look pretty. I mean, you were doing fine with the running for water and the well search and all that. And she actually adds this in verse 13. Hey, if you're going to get cursed, the curse is going to fall on me. Whoa. Good thing he didn't get cursed. <laughs> Obey my voice. And he, he's, again, a mama's voice. So he does. So we have 
Jacob meeting with his father and lying repeatedly when the father presses in and it makes you wonder, huh, maybe Isaac really did want to bless Jacob. Is he that dumb? Was he really that bad off? He couldn't tell. You got goat skin. I mean, to this day, we can see in movies when they've got a bad mustache on their face. And this is, they're going to try to get away with this with goat skin on this sort of fake, feeble old dad who's not even going to be dying soon. I don't think so. I think probably Isaac knew. That's again me. Don't build a church on that one. All right. So uh, Father Isaac says to him, come near and kiss me, comes near and kiss me. And Isaac, uh, Isaac smells the garment and blesses him. And he gives him this blessing. If you look at the blessing, it's all food related. Yeah. The entire thing. And there's other ways. Those are all euphemisms. There's other ways to say you're going to be blessed. But he uses like all, these, all this food imagery. And it just goes back to his stomach. And we see him being true to who he really is. Verse 40, 41. Um, he gets this kind of weak, awful adjacent blessing <laughs> like blessing adjacent um, and he says this interesting line I actually go back to verse 39 behold away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be in other words I just blessed your brother with all the fatness of the earth you're not going to dwell near him that's what that's basically saying here's the fatness of the earth you're not going to dwell you're going to he just talks about the dew that the brother's going to get you're going to be away from that so it's not like you're going to be living in famine all the time is you're not going to be with your brother anymore that's, that, that, you're going to live by your sword and things are going to be really different. We already knew he lives by the sword because he's the one out there killing animals and making stew for his dad, right? So Esau hates Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him. And Esau says, I'm going to kill him. Uh, the days of mourning my father are approaching. It's going to be a long wait. <laughs> <laughs> but then I will kill my brother Jacob. And so Rebecca again overhears this whole thing and that triggers her whole complaint again i loathe my wife my life because of the wife of the hittite women and uh, if jacob marries one of them it's over it's going to be horrible and she's not wrong actually so she gets this whole scheme and uses the pretense of getting away from the hittite women to send him up chapter 28 isaac calls jacob blessed him again by the way directed him don't take a wife from the canaanite women go to padam aram in the house of bethuel so he heads back up to this whole area, um, back where uh, the Laban scenario takes place. And Jacob's on his way, and he says, May he give the blessing to Abraham to you, to your offspring with you, uh, and the land, the sojournings that God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away. He heads on up there. Meanwhile, Esau's like, Maybe I could get on my dad's good side and my mom's, and he marries a local girl, you know, the girl that he should have been marrying all along. And, of course, that doesn't fix his problem anyway. Um, but then Jacob has this interesting dream. And I told you at the opening of this lesson that we had two types, two typology features that were going to happen. The first one is this whole chapter 24 uh, with Eleazar. And now we get to this very short passage, just an insert right here in chapter 28. And he has this dream. And in his dream, he sees the Lord standing above it, this ladder that's set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north, south, and in you, your offspring, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And now, at the very beginning of our lessons through Genesis, we read through the entire book, and you know that he does leave. Jacob leaves. He goes all the way down to Egypt, and he comes back. And um, he does get brought back, like God promises there. And so he makes this... Um, observation, this is place is awesome. This is none other, verse 17, than the gate of heaven. Now, think in your mind right now. What is another portion of scripture in Genesis that we have talked about some kind of an attempt, at least, of a gate to heaven? Tower of Babel. This is a redemption of the Tower of Babel. We have man's effort to build so that God will come down, and we have God going, ha, cute. 
Let me show you how it's done. <laughs> and he brings his angels and they're ascending and they're descending. And you know what's really interesting about this is, again, what's the best commentary on the Old Testament? The New Testament. So Jesus refers to this. Jesus refers to Jacob's dream when Nathanael comes to him in John chapter 1. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Nathanael's brought to Jesus by Philip. And as he approaches, Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And since Jacob, whose name we know gets changed to Israel, was notable for guile as a deceiver of his father, it would seem that Jesus is comparing Nathanael to kind of in a favorable way with his ancestor, Jacob, right? Nathanael's amazed, and he's like, how do you know me, right? Well, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you, and Nathanael's response to that says, extraordinary, he says, rabbi or teacher, you are the son of God, right there, names him right off the bat. This is the very beginning of John, he gets identified. You are the king of Israel. We must suppose then that Nathaniel had his reasons for remembering that time under that fig tree. And he must have sensed that the Lord was knowing his innermost thoughts. So Jesus welcomes Nathaniel's faith. He promises that he's going to see even greater things to come. And he addresses Nathaniel and the others. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open. And the angels of God, what does he say? Ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus promised a revelation that would way surpassed Jacob's dream. That stairway in Jacob's dream was a symbol of the communication that God provides between heaven and earth. Isn't that amazing? And also we know that Jesus himself identifies himself as that gate, that stairway, that ladder. This is Jesus right here in typology. So early in that morning, he sets up that pillar and he promises to give a tenth of everything to God. And then Jacob ends up in this interesting scenario uh, where he, the trickster, gets tricked by Laban. And uh, he ends up marrying, you know, Leah. <laughs> and he ends up marrying his beloved, Rachel. Uh, and we know that Leah's name means um, uh, well, weary, weak-eyed. Um, it actually also has the connotation of the animal, of a cow. So, of course, in modern times, you'd be like, oh, that's the that's a horrible thing to say. If you are a cow to some lady, that'd be horrible. But back then, it, it represented blessing because a cow is your wealth, right? And uh, so then, of course, Rachel, she's a little ewe lamb and she's sweet, but she, he marries a cow and a, and a sheep. It's kind of interesting to play on words right there. All right, then we get this really weird scene. So they have the kids and uh, they, she gets hers and then Rachel finally, you know, gets hers. And the, Bill Ha and Zilpa and all those guys. But then we get this weird thing in verse 14, chapter 30. Her son Reuben comes back and he finds mandrakes. You're like, what is this? And then it gets even weirder because Leah's like, give me some of your mandrakes. I'm going to go sleep with your dad. <laughs> like, that's a great thing to talk to your son about. Uh, so I had you do your little research on that. You found out that mandrakes are used for a variety of reasons in folklore and in folk medicine. And one of them is an aphrodisiac, and that dates all the way back to this time. And uh, we get even weirder because she does it, and Jacob complies. He's like, okay. <laughs> have sex with you again and make another baby with you and they have more babies and uh we wrap this up and we see all the sons being listed and the author makes sure to mention that dinah is listed you know mostly we don't get names of daughters listed because it wasn't done in those days uh, but when they do have a daughter named it's because something's important about that and that as you know is going to come up in the next uh study and so jacob needs to get away from laban it's miserable he needs to go back home and uh, so he works through this whole weird plan to get away from Laban and increase his wealth with this whole sheep plan. And do you recall from the previous lesson when I said, pay attention to trees if they're named? And we talked about the tamarisk tree, remember? And that was pretty cool. And I said, hey, get, get ready. The next lesson, three trees are going to get named. And hopefully you keyed in on that and thought, well, let's figure out what these trees all are about. Maybe Jennifer's going to teach you something new and cool about these trees. No, they mean nothing. It's just weird mysticism and some kind of wives' tale superstition from back in the day. And here is what's interesting about this entire chapter 30. Reuben and his mandrakes, what's that about? Trees and spotted and speckled and 
we've just got just kind of weird stuff that's happening in this chapter and, and how they're engaging with each other. Here's the reality. We do that to this day. We hang on to our weird superstitions and we have just like, maybe this will work and I'll, I'll, I'll try this little remedy or our folklore or, or whatever and we put much stock in it. And basically all of this is saying, you can do whatever you want, I'm gonna still make my plan happen anyway, in spite of you. And so, because to this day, scholars and scientists have no explanation for those three trees, why they're named and what they do, and there's no scientific evidence, and they have studied it, for what those trees uh, would cause to happen. But we do get to the end of this, and in spite of all the weird stuff that happens, God does bless and prosper Jacob. And verse 41, the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels and donkeys. And as we move forward into this next uh, chapter, you're going to see the benefit of that and what God ends up doing. But as we close right now, I want us to think about one thing. At the end of this lesson, I asked you in your Create and Share to travel back in time, if you could, and write a letter through scripture to one of the characters using Psalm 37 as your scripture. And I'd like us to think right now about the truth of that and about in spite of all the shenanigans that went on in this passage, in spite of the nonsense about mandrakes that mean nothing, trees and planting and speckled and spots that mean nothing, God's word remained true and God still continued on with his promise. And so we can hold that scripture very close and personal to us and keep our focus on God and what he's teaching us. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 37. He says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass, like the mandrake, like the trees. It comes of nothing. It means it's meaningless. They will wither like the green herb like the mandrake, right? Trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, befriend faithfulness, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, not in the trees and the spots and the speckles and all that. Get your focus off that and trust in the Lord, and he will act, and God does indeed do that. And my encouragement and my challenge even to you as you go home, before you begin Lesson 9, is to reread Psalm 37. Now that you have the fellowship of your grace groups in your mind, what you've learned from each other, what you've learned here in this teaching time, what God has taught you, go back to Psalm 37 and lay that before the Lord and say, is there any aspect of my life that I keep on going back to, that silly nonsense like mandrakes? trees and sheep and just me conniving and trying to work my life out for my way when I really should just be releasing it and do not fret and commit my way to you. Go back to Psalm 37 and ask God to show that to you. Would you do that? All right, let's close in prayer and then we'll have some Q&R time as you are able. Father God, thank you once again for the power of your word, how it illuminates, gives us hope again and reminds us of where we need to have our focus and that's just with you. Uh, bless these ladies now as we uh, head on home and uh, continue to bless us as we are diligent in studying your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.